Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I like the mask. Oh, I'm in the library. Well, you gotta <laughs> it do has it. to be worn. So, um, so this is cool. I've got slides to show. So can you you make me a co-host? I sure can. Okay. And you're recording it, which is cool because I've had a couple people ask if they can see it. And that's all I need is to, they can get in touch with you or you can put a link up on the library or something. Yes, it will eventually go on the library website. Okay. And yes, it is recording. I'm going to double, triple check that it's recording. Okay, cool. And there's our first guest. Oh, right. I, know, I know who that is. I recognize the picture. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That's cool, or that's Carl, depending on how you're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the two of us. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> this is sweet. Where Carl's putting you up on. Okay. We think. Oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you want me to take You have snow on the vineyard today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, well, we didn't have snow. We had a little rain and drizzle and just sort of overcast. But um, I thought it was going to snow yesterday. I went for a walk and I thought I felt flakes, but I think they were inside my head, not up in the air. It was actually a mix yesterday when I was driving. Yeah. Towards Eggertown. There was a little mix, but it never turned okay. into real snow. So maybe I wasn't crazy. You weren't, no. <laughs> So, well, we'll see if, if we have other people. Otherwise, it's just you, Sandy. It'll be you and Carl, a personal discussion. Oh, good. Well, I can, I can say, look, we're prepared. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, how come it doesn't show there? All right. Show, there it is. This is my book. Ah, I can't make it. My... My mirror image doesn't behave itself. So you tell the uh, tell your publisher you had two people showing. We just are being cheap on one one line. That what was that? That oh, even though it says Carl H, there's really Carl and Sandy. Oh, Carl and Sandy, right? <laughs> well, I could see you. I know who you are. So good, good, very good. Are you talking from your home? Yes, this is um, our dining room. So oh. um, normally we have a picture of Joyce and me up on the wall, but um, because of the holidays, she took it down and put up a Christmas tree. And I did a Zoom talk the other day and I didn't realize she'd done that change until I looked up and she wasn't there. There was a tree instead. <laughs> so I was sort of caught off guard. But, and Sandy, just on a personal note, I did follow up with old, the old mill, just because that's where we went on our high school, uh, the prom, and they sound like a good place, but um, they're booked the, the time that my daughter oh. was looking at, so. Oh, we'll you see. didn't say what it's for. Who's, whose birthday is it, your daughter? Well, she, she's arranging it or wants to arrange oh, for you. So oh. Let's see what happens. Hi, Where is the old mill? Where's it's the old mill? It's way up in no. Westminster. Westminster, and right. Sandy and I and Joyce all went to the same high school many, many, many years ago. Wow. And, you know, um, we're just easing into the next 
age bracket, so to speak. So I used to go to a restaurant called the Old Mill that was in upstate New York near. Well, oh, it was oh. near Great Barrington. OK, So probably not the same one, but it was a very good restaurant. Yeah, good. Well, this this one has been around since 1740 or something. So uh -huh. uh, it's been a while. It has ghosts. It has its own ghost. Oh, cool. That's right. <laughs> How far away is that? Um, it's a couple hours from here. Couple hours. So. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, yeah. No, it's right near Mount Wachusett. So it's sort of central Massachusetts and near Worcester. That's Worcester was the centerpiece where we grew up in the in the surroundings of that area. So that that gives you a little idea of it. Yes, definitely. So who who am who am I seeing on the others? Who's this pretty young person with a hat? Oh, that is it, Caroline is the Oak Bluffs Library. Um, oh. What do you call? What is your official title? Uh, I'm the programming coordinator. Programming well, how do you coordinator. Do, so, how do you do me? thank you for making this happen today. Oh well, yeah. thank you for joining us. <laughs> we'll give it just a couple minutes more to okay. allow. Amika. I can tell a story about Carolina that her claim to fame recently is that. Um, there was somebody who lost the cat on board the ferry and the cat apparently wandered onto the vineyard and nobody knew where it was. And the woman who owned the cat was distraught, but she lived in California and she had to go home and the cat wandered around for a while. Nobody knows, of course, because cats don't tell tales. Um, they, the cat wandered around for quite a while, like a couple of months, I guess. And there was a reward out for finding her. And Carolina's kids uh, amazingly came up with the idea that the cat was around their house and they put food out, saw the cat, cat saw the food and the rest is history that the kids uh -huh. got reward and it was very exciting. So um, did I get the story right, Carolina? That yes, you did, very, very good. Um, it was it was very exciting, and actually, the the family still sends us updates about uh, the cat with like <laughs> pictures and things. It's so sweet, uh, and the cat looks so much healthier now, which yeah. is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> That's sweet. I don't know what that is. It sounds like a clock. <laughs> a little yipper dog. So. Do you want to give it a few more minutes, Tom, or are you ready to get started? Um, I'm, I'm ready. I don't know. Um, you know, we can't count. We can't wait forever. Uh, can, can, can people join, though, if they... If you yes. see their name, you can just let them come in. A, a they bit. come in automatically, yes. Yeah, okay. Because I, I think people who show up on time deserve a bit of a reward in not having to wait too long. I mean, we can we can wait and wait, and if nobody shows up or they people show up late, well, why, why should we be punished, so? Well, good. Well, we'll get started then. Okay. So hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us here this evening. I'm Carolina. I'm the programming coordinator here at the Oak Bluffs Public Library. And tonight we are excited to have with us Thomas Dresser. Thomas is a prolific author who has done many, many programs with us, both in person and we've done a few. Have we done some virtual? We've done at least one or two virtual also. Yeah, oh, yeah. Years yeah. ago, I did quite a few, and um, every so often you'll invite me, or people at the library will invite me to do one on one of the books that I did years ago, because I've, I've been doing this for close to 15 years. Mm -hmm. so. so Tom is an author, a historian, and a tour guide, 
Tom mm -hmm. started writing at age 11 when he founded the Springdale News in 1958. He continued to edit the monthly newsletter for more than 100 issues. That is incredibly impressive. <laughs> until he went off to college some seven years later. Wow. After college, Tom taught elementary school for a decade, then ran several Massachusetts nursing homes over two decades when he was once again bitten by the writing bug. And since 2000, his byline has appeared on countless articles in the local papers on Martha's Vineyard. And he's published more than a dozen pamphlets and books. So thank you very much for being here with us tonight, Thomas. All right. Well, thank you, Carolina. And thank you all for joining us. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about this new book that uh, just came out, uh, I guess, the, the end of um, November, November 29th. And it seems to be selling well. And it's kind of fun to be doing these different book talks because they add a lot to what I learn about the, the story, the topic that I got into. And just the, the background of this is that I had no plans to write about the American Revolution until April Fool's Day of this year. Um, I was in the bookstore over in Egertown and the manager there uh, said to me that he had had two or three people who had asked to see a book about the revolution on Martha's Vineyard, how it unfolded and what happened here with important people and so forth. And he asked if I would like to write that book. And I, I jumped at the idea because I have always loved American history and the revolution is something that, you know, it's sort of the, the focal point of how we all got started here. And when I can relate the idea of Martha's Vineyard to a national topic that we all know about and we're learning, we learned in school and it's still very much part of our background. I thought that was a worthwhile topic. So that's what got me started on this. And I worked with the um, publications at the Martha's Vineyard Museum, the MV Quarterly, which has a lot of sort of detailed pieces of research that are done by vineyarders about myriad topics, but I obviously focused on the revolution. And then we have a historian from 1911 who wrote the key piece, the, a three volume book about the history of Martha's Vineyard, Charles Banks. So I referred to him and then num numerous other books and people I talked to uh, help put this together. Now, the revolution occurred before uh, the advent of photography. So I had to resort to paintings, pictures, sketches, and so forth. But again, Dr. Charles Banks came through with a number of drawings that he did for his book. So I've got some interesting sketches in the, in the book. And then when I needed a photograph, a current picture that I wanted, a photograph that I wanted, I went to my wife, Joyce, who loves to take pictures, and I would give her assignments of places that she had to go and take a picture, and that sort of brought us together on how the, the book shaped up. And then just as far, that's sort of the background of the how the book came together, and then just the overview of the book is that uh, the revolution was really formulated and the, the motto, if you will, that we can remember from grade school was taxation without representation is tyranny. And the background of that is that the English colonists that came here in 1607 in Jamestown or came to Plymouth in 1620, they were used to governing themselves. And they weren't paying taxes to the people in England. Parliament did not tax the patriots, did not tax the colonists. And so they were used to running their own show. So when Parliament started instituting taxes in the 1760s to pay for the French and Indian War, 
the colonists were outraged. And that's where the motto or the, the, the phrase taxation without representation is tyranny. That's where it came about. So what we're going to do is I'm going to switch over to a little slideshow and we'll go through some different pictures and talk about sort of the background of how the revolution unfolded and how people have a, uh, a sense of it on the island, even though it's a little bit different from uh, what happened on the mainland. We had our own incidents and, and situations that evolved because in a lot of ways, the American Revolution was really a civil war. It was two groups of people that were looking at the same issue from different sides. We had the patriots who refused to go with the uh, taxation unless they were represented in parliament, and of course they weren't. And we had the loyalists who supported the crown. And on Martha's Vineyard, we had both those groups. And a lot of people on the vineyard were still supporting the crown. They supported parliament and they were against the revolution. But we had a number of people too who supported revolution. And we'll get to that now as I change to screen share. So we have a title page here of Martha's Vineyard in the American Revolution. And today's the ninth and we move to this first picture. And this is a um, picture of Jonathan Mayhew. And he was a minister in um, Chilmark. He grew up in, uh, on the shores of uh, Tisbury Great Pond. He walked through the woods of, of Chilmark and he knew the Native Americans. And his great great grandfather was Thomas Mayhew, who was the first settler on the vineyard back in 1640. And all the Mayhews through the, the line for those five generations were all ministers. And they were working with the Wampanoag, trying to convince them to become Christianized. And this gentleman, Jonathan Mayhew, born in 1720, was a minister, but he wanted more, or he wanted a different life than living on the vineyard and preaching to the Wampanoag. And he came to Boston and he got a position as the minister of Old West Church on Cambridge Street in Boston. And his, his sermons over the years were very politically motivated. And he um, was very active in agitating the local population against parliament. And the key element of his story was that he was against the Stamp Act, which was when uh, Parliament uh, put forth a tax on any sort of newspapers or paper that uh, the colonists used and put this tax up there and people didn't like it. The locals didn't like it. And uh, Jonathan Mayhew's sermons were so uh, aggressive that people came out and rioted about the Stamp Act and they attacked the, the uh, Lieutenant Governor's house, Thomas Hutchinson, and they really caused quite a stir. And then the, the people in towns around the island and around Massachusetts raised their voices against parliament and against the taxation that was going on. This is one of the sketches from Charles Banks, and it shows how the town meeting was um, the way that the colonists really decided things. They wanted a democratic uh, group of people making a decision. They didn't want an edict passed down by parliament. But parliament didn't seem to, to appreciate this very much. They felt that the English colonists were part of the British empire and that they had to do what parliament told them to do. And they started with the Sugar Act, which was just before the Stamp Act, and that was putting a tax on molasses. And people in Boston were upset about that in the around 1763. 
And that hurt the breweries because they depended on molasses and the sugar tax hurt that. Then we had the Stamp Act in 1765 and there were all these riots and rebellion over that, but parliament didn't get the message. The next thing they did was the Townsend Acts and the Townsend Acts was all about tea. That was the biggest thing that, that people realized in this country. They said a tax on tea. Well, we depend on tea to drink, to keep us happy. And it's what we like at the end of the day. And we drink it just like people do in England. But why should we pay a tax on tea? We never did before. We don't think that's right. Now, you may have heard that there was a tea party in Boston in 1773. Um, three whale ships that were from Nantucket went over, sailed over to England with a load of whale oil. They sold the whale oil and they loaded the three boats with tea. And they came back to Boston Harbor. And on December 17th, 1773, a number of the Sons of Liberty, the Patriots, um, boarded the three ships and threw the tea in the harbor. And they made their point very clearly and they didn't pay the tax on tea, but they didn't get to drink the tea. Now, if you're on the vineyard, you probably have seen this sign. It's on North Road and it points to T Lane down middle, across to Middle Road. And the name is attributed to the pre-revolutionary consumption of contraband tea. And contraband because it was smuggled onto the island by a, a, seaman, a sailor who wanted to bring the tea home to his uh, ailing sister-in-law. And they, he smuggled the tea onto Tea Lane and hid it there. And we have a little poem that sort of tells the story of what happened on Tea Lane. In the strenuous days of 76, when drinking tea got folks in a fix, twas Robert Hillman, he from London brought some tea to his sister-in-law who dwelt on the lane that she might drink and her health regain. Now the tax collectors all came to Hillman's house looking for tea, but they couldn't find it. For out in the barn was the tea hidden snug and never a single ugly mug thought to look so far from the kitchen fire for the brew that hot water made one desire. So Mrs. Hillman was left quite free to drink her fill of the London tea. And thus came the lane by its well-earned name, though my search for the reason had all been in vain. So that's the story of T Lane. And uh, what happened on the vineyard was, was a couple of years before the, um, the tea party in Boston, I believe, but it was the same era and it was about the same topic. And so that's how, leading up to the revolution. Now we have a couple of stories about seafaring adventures that happened around Martha's Vineyard. Uh, this is a very dramatic picture of what's happened, what happened, but the two stories I have are much calmer and smaller, but I have, this is the closest we have to a, a picture that's appropriate. So there's a little island off of Martha's Vineyard called Noshan. And there was an inn there in the, seven, in the 1700s. And shortly after Lexington and Concord, a innkeeper was there with his family and a British ship came into the harbor of Tarpaulin Cove and the captain came over and demanded that the innkeeper turn over some sheep, his weapon and uh, smash a couple of whale boats. And the innkeeper did not want to do this, but with a British ship, you can't argue. They've got soldiers and guns and, you know, the innkeeper didn't have much to protect himself with. So he did what he was told to do. But then he, interestingly, he went to the Barnstable court and he filed a court action against the British. 
And we don't know what the outcome of that was, but it did get into the court's system and we were able to read about it 250 years later. So that was a story that happened with a British ship in uh, the island of Narshon. Now, another incident that had the opposite impact occurred off Chappaquiddick, and that was a British um, supply ship. It was not armed with cannon, and the, there were only a few crew members on board, and they had sailed from England. They were heading to Boston, and they got stuck in a bit of a storm off Edgartown, and they ran aground. And a group of the local militia came out in a little whale boat, fired a few weapons, and captured the ship. The ship was called the Harriet, and this happened in March of 1776. And the people who have researched this story say that it's the first incident during the revolution where there was an attack at sea. And so they consider it the first naval battle of the revolution and to think that it happened right here on Martha's Vineyard. Now, the militia groups were um, formed because here we see the British soldiers. We know about the red coats that occupied Boston and the uh, British soldiers presented quite a threat. They were all over the city of Boston and, and people on the vineyard were well aware of it. So they wanted to form their own militia and get some protection in case the British did more activities like they did on Noshon Island. They were, locals were afraid of British power. And what happened was they raised two groups of militia. So this is a picture of the British. And you, if you look at them, the soldiers are carrying their weapons over their left shoulder. That was the way things went with the British. And then we look at the American or the Patriots, and this is the militia of on Martha's Vineyard. And the few rifles we can see look like they're over the right shoulder. So you can see that the, the divide between right and left. And what happened was in the fall of 75, and in, again in January of 76, the um, two militia companies were formed on Martha's Vineyard, and each company was made up of 50 men. They had, obviously, captains and a couple of officers, but interestingly, here's a fife and drummer that are out there doing their thing. So these two companies were there giving us some sort of protection, but they only lasted for about a year because in Boston, the, the general court, the, the uh, Senate and the House, if you will, the legislature, ran out of money and they had to disband in the vineyard protection. So that put us really in a bad way. And it was really every man for himself. There was no more protection for the vineyard. And they had to really negotiate uh, a, a peaceful type of existence trying to deal with what Boston wanted them to do and trying to avoid getting in trouble with what the Redcoats were all about. So it was a very tense time here on the vineyard. And as I said earlier, there were lo loyalists, people who were supported the crown and supported parliament. And then there were a lot of patriots who were against it. So it put us in a very um, difficult situation. Now in, September of 1777, there was a British ship sailing around Gay Head, and it was chasing an American supply ship, and it ran the supply ship ashore. And the British were starting to attack the supply ship, and there was a young man up on the cliffs of Gay Head. You can see how high the cliffs are. And he, um, this man was aiming at the British ship. He was a patriot. He was a black man. He had been a slave and had recently been freed. And he fired at the British ship 
and the people in the, the red coats fired back and they killed him. And this man was the first and the only um, victim of the war on the vineyard. Numerous people went off to sea or went to the mainland and were killed from the vineyard. But here, this man, Sharper Michael, black man, was killed because he was trying to defend the homeland. And we think that is, it, that's a memorable experience right here to, to our history. Now, there were several other skirmishes that happened around this time in 76, 77. And one of them was occurred in uh, Long Point in West Tisbury, and a British ship fired a cannonball. This was the cannonball that fired at a fellow named George Manter, who was the ancestor of the police chief, George Manter, and his son, Skip Manter, who's now with the, is still with the West Tisbury police. And this cannonball was fired at George Manter, and he avoided it, he didn't get hit, but interestingly, he saved the cannonball and preserved it in his family for 250 years. And we just think that's kind of neat that he was able to do that. And this is not part of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. This is, this is a private family that has uh, possession of the cannonball. Now I move on to the two big events that happened um, during the revolution on Martha's Vineyard. The first was the Liberty Pole incident and the second was Gray's Raid. And this is sort of the high point of what happened during the war. And we know that um, in April of 1778, a British ship came into Vineyard Haven Harbor it had a broken mast and it needed a repair. And there was a li liberty pole on the island that um, people would gather and that's how they sort of uh, talked about their rebellion and how they felt about things. And, and it was sort of a spirit of liberty. And the British captain named John Ford wanted the mast for his ship. And he talked or he bargained with the Tisbury selectmen, and it was agreed that he would take the mass, take the Liberty Pole to repair his mass the next day. Well, that night, three women who were in their uh, late teens, early 20s, decided to blow up the mass, the pole, the Liberty Pole. And if you look closely at the picture, you can see a drill or an auger on the ground, three holes in the Liberty Pole. And the woman on the left has a little, uh, some gunpowder that she was going to pour in the, into the Liberty Pole, into the holes there. She lit it and blew up the pole and it was no longer able to be used as a mast. And we consider this a very historic and heroic act. And people through the years have talked about it as being sort of uh, mythical that it didn't really happen. But we do have documentation that it took place. And here we have a picture of one of the three women, Polly Daggett Hillman and uh, she lived to the ripe old age into the 1830s, and she filed a document in Congress that talked about her experience blowing up the, the Liberty Pole years before. Off to the uh, right of the screen, there's a picture of the Liberty Pole, which is up on um, Manters Hill in, in Tisbury, and there's a plaque at the, um, on the pole which sort of gives the names and the, and the history of what happened. So that's kind of a neat uh, experience and a true story of heroism in the revolution on the vineyard. Now we move on to the story of Dr. Charles, um, not Dr., General Charles Gray. And obviously no, 
photographs, but this etching sort of gives a lot of character of what the guy looked like. And he was, he was right up there in the British Army. And his uh, job, as he saw it, was to sail along the south coast of Massachusetts, uh, burning buildings and destroying uh, businesses and stealing as much food as he could. And he came to Martha's Vineyard in September of 1778. He had 4,500 troops and 40 ships and they landed and they started to uh, gather up as many sheep as they could. They demanded that all the sheep on the island be marched down to uh, Vineyard Haven Harbor and loaded aboard ships. And the ships went off to Newport to feed the British army during the um, autumn of, of 1778 and 10,500 sheep were brought down to the harbor. And the island was absolutely economically devastated by this activity. No one was shot, no one was injured, no one was killed. All these sheep were brought away. The British did uh, steal uh, tax money from each of the town's treasuries. They did destroy a number of boats in uh, both Edgartown Harbor and Vineyard Haven Harbor. And one of the more damaging things they did was to destroy the salt works, which was in Vineyard Haven Harbor. And that really hurt a lot of people because they need salt and they had to evaporate water. That's how they got it. And it was just a very unsettling time and when you think of the terror of all these British around, it just makes it quite an experience. So this is the, the worst thing that happened on the vineyard. And here we have another poem to, to sort of symbolize this. In the fall of 1778, when we were at war with Britain great, the Tisbury folks one morning bright looked out on a scene that unnerved them quite. For anchored sure in her waters blue of British warships lay 82. And then the wisest held their breath. Had they come for plunder or battle and death? 10,000 sheep they drove to the shore of cattle 300 head and more. Their fields are swept of new mown hay by thousands of Britons under gray. And from their homes on baking day, they took their puddings and pies away. So it was really a totally plundering experience and really hurt the vineyard as much as anything short of actual firing weapons and so forth. Now we move on to the Battle of Falmouth. This is a scene that happened in um, the spring of 1779. And the British were on a, a little skirmish over in Falmouth. They came over in small boats and they raided the shoreline, taking a, a couple heads of cattle, much smaller operation than General Gray. This is just another skirmishing incident. And they, they took the cattle, but they couldn't get them on board ship on, in time because the Falmouth uh, militia, they still had their militia, they came out and they started firing at the British. And so the British got in their little rowboats and rowed away. And the next day they came back, the British came back and they brought all their warships and they came to attack, not just gather those few head of cattle, but to attack the town of Falmouth and totally destroy it. And their mission was like a really devastating armed attack. And that's what they intended to do. And they started launching cannonballs that were supposed to uh, go up as far as the town, 
but they didn't get far enough. And they were repelled by some 200 uh, militiamen that gathered because they, they got wind that the British were coming and they opened, the militiamen opened fire on the British and sent them on their way. And so this is the Battle of Falmouth and it's the most dramatic uh, scene. And we use this picture on the cover of the book because it's so dramatic with the British ships in the harbor and all the militiamen firing. But unfortunately, it, or fortunately, it didn't take place on Martha's Vineyard. It took place on the mainland right near Woods Hole. However, if you look closely, you can see Martha's Vineyard in the background. It's sort of a triangle off in the distance, right where those three tiny ships are, that's the vineyard. Now, just the origin of these pictures, this one, believe it or not, is a mural right on the wall in the post office in Falmouth. And it was very difficult to take this picture, obviously, because you've got a light hanging right over your head and it's got the postmaster's nameplate there. And then practically across the street at the Falmouth Town Hall is a painting here by a man named Joseph Downs. And this is just such an impressive painting. It, it sets the book out and you know, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but because we put it on the cover, we're kind of happy with it. So we have one more picture to discuss. This is the gravestone of a man named Joseph Thaxter. And his story is rather interesting. He uh, grew up in Westford near Concord and he uh, went to school to become both a doctor and a minister. And he was part of the Concord Militia Unit as a minister in, his, in the first episode where he was at the Battle of Concord and Lexington in April of 1775. And then a couple months later, he was at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And at Bunker Hill, he acted as a physician, he worked with Dr. Joseph Warren, who was killed at Bunker Hill, but Thaxter survived. And five years later, he returned to being a minister and he was offered a job at the uh, Congregational Church in Edgartown. And he served in that church for 40 years from, or more than 40 years, because 1780, to the 18, late 1820s, more than 40 years. And in 1825, he was invited to Charlestown, right outside Boston, to uh, officiate at the ceremony of laying the cornerstone for the Bunker Hill Monument, because that is in honor of the Bunker Hill, the Battle of Bunker Hill, and because he was there and he was a minister, he was asked to say a few words and Lafayette was there and it was quite a, a big deal. So I thought Joseph Thaxter was kind of a, an appropriate uh, way to conclude the book because he was, he was so involved in different elements of the revolution. And just on a personal note, we're, um, my wife Joyce and I are going to Boston tomorrow and to Charlestown and we're gonna check out the Bunker Hill Monument. So I haven't been there since I was a kid, so it'll be kind of fun to see it. So that concludes the story. This is the uh, cover of the book, and the book is available at Edgartown Books. It's at Bunch of Grapes, and for Oak Bluffs people, it's right on Circuit Avenue at Phillips Hardware. So you're more than welcome to stop by any of those shops and pick up a copy or you can get in touch with me at thomasdresser at gmail.com or thomasdresser.com. And I'm happy to um, work with you on however you want to buy a book. So this is how we, um, how excited we were when the book came out. So that concludes my little conversation with you. And I'm happy to answer questions or if you have chat uh, items you'd like to 
find out anything more about, I'm happy to talk to you about that or answer questions. So let me see if I can get out of this okay and move back to reality. And here I am. So very good. So Caroline, um, I don't know if you have anything that you wanted to add, but this is your opportunity. And then if there are questions or comments, we can go from there. Any comments? Um, hi, Tom. This is Carl. Hi. Uh, so I, I had a question about the loyalists. Where did they go after the uh, settlement of the revolution? Well, a, a good number of them went to Nova Scotia. Those who didn't have English connections would go up to Canada. And that was, you know, where a lot of people settled. Um, everybody had to make their own way out of here because the British couldn't really uh, support anyone beyond family members. But um, I don't know where in Canada, it, but um, I believe it was Nova Scotia that would they would have gone to. It was tough because, you know, if you make, if you, are on the wrong side in a in a war it really it changes everything and the loyalists lost their houses they lost their business they lost virtually everything so it was kind of a tough tough decision to go with but they had to they had to make their choice so Tom, this is uh, Pierce Kirby uh, thank you very much I'm at the actually at the Oak Bluffs library now um, and uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the talk. How long did it take you to research this? And, and what new material do you think you found? Like the cannonball thing is very interesting since I'm from West Yeah. Um, well, I'm embarrassed to say how, how long it took because I, I started this April Fool's Day and it was ready to go off for a first edit with the publisher by the 4th of July. So it was really three months and it was, it just flowed because um, even though the libraries didn't, weren't open uh, for the most part, I did have somebody at the Oak Bluffs library, Nina Ferry, who had a whole uh, stack of the quarterly magazine that the um, museum puts out and it was online. So I had two sources there to, to work with. And I was, I wasn't going crazy working 15 hours a day but one piece just flowed into something else and it was it just it came together very very quickly and then you ask about what what new things i found well i think i you know i could i could tell you the whole story <laughs> i could read the book but two things that i found were that um the heroes if you will of the vineyard they just jumped out at you as, as very creative, crafty um, people who really knew what they were doing. And two of them were Nathan Smith and Nathan Daggett. And Nathan Smith was, uh, he had fought in the French and Indian War side by side with the British. So we had sort of an inside scoop on how the British uh, maneuvered their military. But um, mm. I heard this story from a, uh, a, an eighth grade teacher and I thought she was making it up. And then I, I read about it in two or three sources, but apparently this Nathan Smith was, he lived on Lambert's Cove. He was a farmer, but also a military man. And some British came in a little whale boat and they came ashore and they were trying to steal his sheep. And obviously he didn't want it. He put on his uniform from the French and Indian War and he marched back and forth behind a sand dune, but he was so that they could see his head and his uniform or at the top of his head. And he was barking out orders to this imaginary group of soldiers. <laughs> and <coughs> he, he kept 
raising the ante of what they were supposed to be doing. And he went marched back and forth and he startled the British so much when he, he got his, his imaginary soldiers lined up and ready to shoot or to charge and then shoot. Um, the British left the, the sheep, jumped in their boat and sailed away. And I just love that story. And, you know, there's enough about that Nathan Smith that uh, he did a number of things like that. So there's, there's really an element of truth to it it could be dramatized. I'm sure it was dramatized, but it just shows what a character he was and how successful he was. And then the story of Nathan Daggett, uh, he was the brother of Polly Daggett, who was one of the three uh, Liberty Pole ladies. And he was a pilot who worked out of Newport for many years. And then he got involved in the Continental Navy and as a pilot, he sailed down to the West Indies and he led the French ships that were coming over to help at uh, Washington. He, he led them away from the British and the British didn't know where he was because he was, he was able to sort of hide the, the French away from them. And he let the English get ahead of him. They were both sailing toward Yorktown. They were trying to, to the British were trying to help Cornwallis and the French were trying to, to dissuade the, the English. And the English sailed ahead of the French and got to Cornwallis at Yorktown, saw there were no French ships there and they sailed on to New York. And that's exactly what Daggett wanted to have happen. And he came up later with the French and the French and Washington with his troops cornered Cornwallis. And that was basically the, the Battle of Yorktown was almost a non-factor because Cornwallis was trapped and cornered. And that's what Daggett succeeded in doing. So you have two heroes of the revolution from Martha's Vineyard. That's great. Thank what you. boat are you uh, on tomorrow, by the way? I'm leaving on the 1045, by the way. What, what was that? Are you said you're going to Boston tomorrow? What what boat are you on, by the way? Just out of Oh, A A15. Oh, okay, I'll miss you. <laughs> I'm off all We're going to the Gardner Museum first. Mm -hmm. And um, I could say we're returning paintings that we borrowed, but I won't. Um, <laughs> but that there, there's an exhibit there of Titian paintings that has been put together and I've just been bugging my wife that I want to do it. So we'll do that in the Bunker Hill Monument. Right. So 815 boat, change your plans, come with us. <laughs> okay, another question. I do have another question here. Do you have any idea how the Methodists that congregated around Oak Bluffs felt regarding loyalism versus patriotism? Okay, any, any idea of how the Method, uh, do you have an idea of the Methodists that congregated around? Um, okay, the Methodist campground didn't come into existence until um, 1835. There were, the first Methodist was a black man, Saunders, I think. He came in 1787 and he was um, smuggled aboard a ship in a, in a corn, um, corn, what do you call corn, where they keep corn on board ship so that no one would find him. And he didn't come here till 1787. So it was after the revolution. So he wasn't, um, he wasn't, he wasn't here. There weren't no Methodists. There was no settlement by Methodists until into the 1820s, really, 1830s. And I see on chat, you've got a question of the percentage of residents who were loyalists. And that, um, that's, that's a little bit hard to give a, a number to. I can tell you the population of Martha's Vineyard as the war began was about 2,700 people. And we had three representatives in the general court and two of them were loyalists, and one of them was a patriot. And 
So if, if it's a percentage, whatever, of that, you could say that there were nearly 2,000 loyalists and 1,000 um, patriots, but it wasn't, it wasn't split like that. Um, those are just who got elected. But I don't know if that answers your, your question. They, it was hard to, to judge who or how many of any uh, specific view there were, because a number of the men were out at sea and um, you know they could have been just working and you didn't necessarily know what their political uh, situation was. The, um, the story of the Battle of Falmouth is interesting because you, you heard what I said, how the British in a small boat went over to get cattle and they were repelled and went back to their island, to their headquarters, and they were at an inn, and it could have been the same inn that that uh, fellow was in before that I talked about, but he was it. they were in an inn getting drunk, and they were talking about how they were going to go back to Falmouth the next day and bombard it and blow up the, the town and set it on fire and the whole thing. And the innkeeper, in this case, was a loyalist. And he sent, he didn't want to have the town of Falmouth burned, destroyed. So he sent his son across Vineyard Sound and warned the people in Falmouth that there was going to be trouble. And they were able to get a militia group, not just from Falmouth, but they got one from Sandwich and they got one from Barnstable. So there were really three different groups there. And they were they spent the night planning and plotting this once and and then the, when the British came they were totally ready for it so it was a very um, aggressive uh, response and it was a loyalist who got that thing started so that's another little piece of of trivia that's kind of interesting so another question. Oh, we do have someone that's looking for original information. And if you have any ideas of where to find original documents created by early residents of the island. Wow, good question. Original documents. Um, I mean, the museum has a few pieces that I'm aware of. They have a, a list of the people who signed up for the first militia group. And so you can see their signatures there. Um, they, they, the museum also has a letter that the captain of the boat, the supply ship that was attacked by the vineyarders and the captain, um, well, the, the crew was taken out, uh, to the mainland and put in prison. The captain was humiliated because the local people took away his uniform. And he was so upset that he wrote a letter to General George Washington and asked for his clothes back. He said it was, you know, not responsible. He was, he was embarrassed to be going around with not wearing the appropriate clothes. And that letter that was mailed or that was sent to George Washington never made it. At least there was no response from Washington and the museum came across the letter and they've got it in their archives. So the, the best source for original documents right here and now is the Martha's Vineyard Museum. But when I did a, I did a book a few years ago on the shipwreck of the city of Columbus off of Gay Head in 1884, and I went to the National Archives to get uh, data about the, uh, the list of supplies that were on board the ship and uh, specifics about the ship. And the National Archives, we have an access point right in, um, right around one, Route 128, just outside Boston and Newton or somewhere around there. And I just went in there, I told them what I wanted. I think I knew that, that, that the information was there and I was able to track it down. So you've got another question, uh, wondering how many relocated, pretty, 
Um, there's a, a question about how many people relocated. That goes back to Carl's question, I guess, about the loyalists. Um, the population of the vineyard did not change all that dramatically because we have the first census was 1765. And that's when there were something like 2,500 or 600. And then the first official United States census was 1790. And it was pretty close to the same amount. So it doesn't, by those two um, bits of information, we don't have too many loyalists leaving the vineyard or too many new people coming in if you just look at the round numbers. Of course, you could lose 50 people and gain 50 people, but I don't think there was a great turnover. Um, and, and just getting back to the original question of where did loyalists go and how many went and so forth, I, I don't have specific information on that. I just know that if they were loyalists and they were determined to, to go back to their homeland or to a place that supported them politically, it would be either Canada or, or over to England. I have one more story to, to whet people's appetite and, and to answer about another thing that I learned that was fascinating was that <clears throat> there was this British uh, officer who was sort of like a secretary to General Gray and he communicated information between different generals. And I read his name and I thought, well, that sounds sort of familiar. And then I looked into it a little deeper and the man's name was John Andre and Major John Andre was very involved in Gray's raid of Martha's Vineyard in uh, September, 1778. Two years later, 1780, he was very involved in Benedict Arnold trying to turn over West Point and becoming a traitor. So here we have somebody who was a British officer and he worked with one of our best generals and uh, worked with him to become a traitor. And Andre was hanged because he was caught and considered a traitor. Benedict Arnold went off and uh, joined the British and he and his wife made their way over to London. So. You know, it's just sort of an interesting sort of twist on how history unfolds. So. All right, well, do we have any other questions? I guess I just had a couple of comments besides telling you what a, what a good job you've done on this, Tom. And <laughs> I've really enjoyed your research and your writing. Well, uh, one was, I bet if you're going to Bunker Hill tomorrow, you're really going to see Breed's Hill. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the other is on our island up in Canada, Prince Edward, we have a Loyalist Road and we have really? a Loyalist Cemetery. So wow. I know. So they, they went as far as Prince Edward Island, some of them. Yeah. Oh, that would be fascinating to sort of find out where they came from, assuming they were, you know, from, from the states, from the colonies. Now, that's good. That can be your research next time you go back up there. So, Oh, that's good. We had a hard time understanding what they were talking about, the Lyalist, the Lyalist Road. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, you got one more question up there. Where is the book for sale? Um, the easiest way is to go to thomasdresser.com and I have it on my website and I can ship it out to Idaho or wherever anyone is interested. But it also is available in local bookstores, Bunch of Grapes, Egertown Books, and Phillips Hardware. So, all right. Well, thank you all for joining me. And thank you, Carolina, for putting this together. And I guess it's on, it, this has been recorded. So if anybody uh, wants to see me again, um, check in with Carolina, it'll be on the Oak Bluffs website uh, sometime down the road.
Well, thank you so much again, Tom. You're just a treasure trove of information. It's always a pleasure. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And come back soon. Very good. Thank Have a good you. Night. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good care.